Hi, my name is Callie Chappelle, and welcome to this video about the rules of EFG and GTP and translocation. This video is made for MCVB 427, which is molecular biology at the University of Michigan. So before we jump into the data, let's a quick let's take a quick overview look at translocation in translation. So we're jumping into the second step of translation, where we have a um, we have a tRNA that has a, a polypeptide here in the P site, and we have an amino isolated tRNA that came into the A site. And step two of, of, um, of translation is peptidyl transferase, where this polypeptide gets transferred onto this amino acid. And we have a tRNA that's no longer charged here in the P site. And the last step is translocation. This is the stuff that we're really interested in, what's going on here. And translocation, we find out from this data, is, is mediated by EFG and GTP. And what happens is, uh, essentially, these two amino acids get shifted over, they get translated, or they get translocated. And the key thing for this assay is that this kind of naked tRNA gets stuck in the E site or the exit site. And the, uh, the assay that we're going to be doing um, actually happens in vitro. So what happens is this tRNA gets thrown to the E site, and it binds loosely in vitro, so essentially it gets released. Now, let's talk a little bit about the assay. So typically when we talk about this different sites in, in a ribosome, we're thinking, oh, pyromycin assay on top of that. And if you don't know what the pyromycin assay is, definitely take a look at that video that explains it in depth. So usually we do a pyromycin assay, and we could have done it to measure translocation. But instead, they actually do a little bit of a wonky, a wonky assay. And what they do is instead they measure the release of this tRNA after, location, after translocation. They measure the release of this deacetylated tRNA. And remember that normally this tRNA would be in the E site, but because this is done in vitro, it actually binds loosely and functionally gets released. So what they do is they do this filter binding assay. And on this filter, so remember filter binding assays, if you're confused about this, check out that video. But uh, things, proteins stick to it and other things don't. So when they do the filter binding experiment, the ribosome and anything that's on the ribosome, so like this tRNA that has this polypeptide, that will stay on the filter. And anything that's not on the ribosome anymore, like this released tRNA from the E site, that will go right through and that they can collect that and measure how much there is. So they can measure the free tRNA, so the free deacetylated tRNA, and the details about how they actually do all this is really not important. Um, this is kind of a, a crude drawing. This actually is not not really that great of an approximation of what they did, but this is kind of how you can think about it for the purposes of this course. Um, and and I would highly recommend you read the paper if you're interested in uh, reading more about it. I like I really enjoyed reading additional papers while well in this class um, because discussion wasn't enough. So now let's take a look at the data, because that is the most interesting part, because that actually explains a little bit more about the nature of EFG and GDP, which is why we're all here. So let's just go through what this is saying. So the first thing I just want to show you what these columns mean. So here we're talking about tRNA release, so that's the amount of this guy release that they measured using this uh, this crude filter binding assay. And this column, they're just showing you straight up how much tRNA was released in picomoles. And here it's the um, it's the difference between um, none, so this is a control, and these the variety of treatments that they have. And they do two different experiments. I'm going to go through each one with you now. So the first two, they add GTP and EFG alone and see how much tRNA is released. And what you can see here is not very much tRNA re was released as compared to adding nothing at all. So really, this is insignificant and indicates that alone GTP or EFG is not sufficient to cause uh, a, a significant amount of translocation. But when they add EFG and GTP together, we do see we see a huge amount of tRNA being released, which indicates that together EFG and GTP are, are very important for translocation. So the next question they wanted to ask themselves was, well, what about GTP is necessary? Could it be the hydrolysis? So they add this analog to GTP, a uh, GDPCP that is non-hydrolyzable. It's non-hydrolyzable. And they ask, well, do we see a similar amount of release or do we see a substantially less uh, release? Um, and we see that even though it's slightly less than with GTP, GDPCP still causes a pretty large amount of tRNA release. So the conclusion here is that hydrolysis is not necessary. It's something else about GTP that is important for translocation. So if GDPCP works, like we see here, then we'll know that it's a GTP bound form of EFG, right, GTP found form of EFG that's involved in translocation. And this is consistent with what we see up here, where EFG doesn't work by itself. 
And so, also you can conclude that hydrolysis is not important, because if hydrolysis was important, then we'd see almost no TRNA release, or we'd see numbers more in this order of magnitude, um, because they, we sim it simply, EFG simply wouldn't work if hydrolysis was, um, if hydrolysis was required. But that's not the case. Hydrolysis is not necessary. Let me write that out. I was just explaining to you how, what if, if it was, but hydrolysis is not necessary. And the reason why that is is because GDPCP plus EFG cause a increase a large amount, we'll just say a large amount or a large enough amount of tRNA release. Now, you might notice that, okay, well maybe it's arguable that there's something about GTP that's a little bit better than GDPCP, because when we have GDP, we see a little bit more tRNA release. And even though you can't conclude uh, the, what I'm about to tell you from th this data, it is something that's kind of interesting. And the reason why you see a little bit of an increase with GTP is because GTP actually can be catalytic. So the EFG GTP complex can actually be recycled, which results in a little bit more tRNA being released. But you can't conclude the fact that GTP and EFG gets recycled from strictly these data. Now let's talk about experiment two. And in many ways, experiment two and the conclusion of experiment two are the same as experiment one, and I'll definitely flag that. But let's go through and explain it uh, in, in parts so you can kind of understand how the, pr the thought process of, of reading and understanding this data works. So again, we have none, and when we add EFG, uh, we essentially get the exact same thing between none. So again, this confirms to us that EFG alone is not sufficient to cause translocation. And again, like up here, when we add EFG and GDP together, we see a pretty substantial increase in the amount of translocation that occurs that indicates that EFG and GDP together are necessary for a uh, release of tRNA. Now they add this funny thing called fusidic acid. And what is fusidic acid? It prevents the, it prevents the dissociation of EFG from the ribosome. So it prevents, it's actually an antibiotic. Dissociation of EFG from ribosome. And so what do we see in the presence of fusidic acid? We actually see an increase in tRNA release, but it's not a huge amount. So, so I wouldn't go so far as to say that fusidic acid actually makes uh, tRNA release better. But what I think we can say is that in the presence of fusidic acid, you still see translocation. So EFG doesn't have to dissociate from the ribosome for translocation to happen, right? Because if fusidic acid is there and it's preventing that dissociation, of the EFG, the, uh, the reaction, the translocation can still occur. So um, even though the numbers like aren't great, they're not super together, you can still make that conclusion. The conclusion is still valid from these data. And again, we can make the same conclusion about GDPCP. These two the, are pretty similar, and they're like in the same, the same range of change between, between this, right? So we see a slight decrease in GDPCP, but they're still uh, kind of close. And so again, that confirms that hydrolysis is not necessary, that GDP and EFG um, alone are sufficient to cause a large amount of tRNA release. So it has to be something about GTP and, the, and EFG together, those bound, that bound form. All right, and then this, you see the same thing with fusidic acid. We see a slight increase, and again, um, the conclusion is the same from that, that EFG doesn't have to dissociate from the ribosome for translocation to happen, even with GDPCP. So the takeaway from experiment two are, is really threefold. The first, it verifies that EFG alone does not translocate the tRNA. All right, EF, oops, EFG alone does not translocate. And what tells us that is... Comparing these two, these are pretty much the same. These two, pretty much the same. The second thing that the second experiment tells us is that EFG bound, or I'm sorry, GTP bound EFG does translocate the tRNA. So EFG and GTP translocates. That's shown by comparing these two, the none versus this, where we see a substantial increase here from here. And the third thing that this tells us, and this is where fusidic acid comes in, is it shows that EFG doesn't have to leave the ribosome for this to happen, because when we add fusidic acid and it can't leave the ribosome, we still see tRNA release. So EF 
she doesn't have to leave ribosome for translocation. So these are the conclusions from experiment two. I hope that this was clear and that you understood what's going on because this is a pretty cool and interesting experiment.